from uh, the University of New Brunswick in Canada and his topic today will be the absolute age of crustaceans, a novel technique. Doctor, over to you. Thank you very much, Jason. Welcome and I am delighted to be here in Australia on the other side of the world. And before I start, I need to give all the credit to uh, Mark Gubert who initiated the communication with me in Canada. And we have been working uh, together to write a proposal to the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. And uh, uh, we were very successful to bring me here. So uh, I am uh, thankful. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I divided the talk into uh, three outlines, background, the new technique, and the application. And I chose uh, a couple of uh, case studies, results that I have submitted to uh, publication. And besides the case studies, I, uh, I will share with you two pilot studies that I am engaged uh, in right now. As a background, everybody knows that in order to determine the age in A3, just cut the trunk and count the rings the three rings, assuming that each ring is equal to one year in the age of the tree, the age of this tree can be determined easily. But the trick here is how am I going to prove that each ring is equal to one year? So the same concept <coughs> is applied in all, almost all aquatic organisms. So the hard structure that may be present in the body of the organism can be dissected out or extracted, processed in a certain way, and this process differs from one species to another. And examples of those hard structures, uh, otolith in any fish, vertebrae, and mainly vertebrae is used to determine the age of sharks, shells of mollusks, uh, uh, like bivalves. Uh, to, uh, to give everybody an example of uh, the growth annuli that may be found in uh, the otolith of a fish, this otolith is a thin section of yellowtail flounder. And as you can see here, the dark dots indicate annulus or growth bands that were proven to be equal to one year of the age in this animal. But the trick here is the rings get crowded at the edge of the otolith, and depending on how clear the section is, the crowded or, uh, annuli may show or may not. And just to enlarge the edge of this otolith, you can see here more than half of the age of this animal are indicated by many annuli towards the edge of the uh, otolith. But on the other hand, it can be very easy. This is the Greenland cockles, and this is a thin section of the shell. It shows that the annuli can be shown easily on the edge of the shell itself or on the quadrophore or the hinge of the shell or the one valve. This guy was proven to be six years old, and again, it has to be proven or confirmed or the word that everybody used in this field is validated. So the validation is a major and essential step in this work to validate that each ring is equal to one year of the age of the animal. So what's the importance of knowing the piece of information or the age information of this organism? Basically, the growth rate, we cannot know how much does the animal grow per unit time except by knowing the age of this animal. Yeah. So uh, geographic differences. And one of the case studies that I will share with you is to study the growth rate of the animal that live or that were collected from different latitudes. Latitudes means different, may mean different temperature. So as an example, the mackerel was found, the same species, much faster uh, uh, on the west compared to the, to, to the east. 
Also, the surf clam, which is very important uh, species in Canada, in eastern Canada, it was found that the same species can grow on the same bank that is about 10 square kilometer. At least three stocks of the same species were found to grow on this area. Unless you know the age of the animal, unless you know the technique to determine the age of this animal, you won't be able to monitor the fisheries of this species. Also, the age of sexual maturity is very important piece of information to uh, in stock assessment or population dynamics. Natural mortality, of course, and by putting those inputs in a model that use, is used in stock assessment of any commercial species, you can find out at the end or the, mod, the, the product of this model can provide you as a, a fishery scientist or manager can provide you the maximum sustainable yield. So unless you know those inputs, age, mortality, age as sexual mortality, you won't be able to reach the value of the maximum sustainable yield in an accurate value. So in those species that the age information is absent, you need to replace it with another information such as length, which has proven to be less accurate than the age. And that's why in species that you cannot determine the age in them, stock assessment or fisheries management is less uh, accurate than other species. I'm talking now about crustacean. Crustacean is the only group in aquatic animals that you cannot determine the age of an individual. The age of an individual. Why? Because a crustacean organism needs to molt. Everybody knows the word molting means shedding off the skeleton. The animal cannot grow unless it loses the hard structure, the skeleton, and spends some time between two phases where the animal has the skeleton on its body, during this phase, which is called the intermolt phase, the animal grows. The animal does not grow outside this phase. So molting gave the impression to crustacean biologists in the world that even the animal, if the animal deposits annual rings, the rings will be lost during molting. And that's why the biologist or crustacean biologist couldn't apply the concept of the three rings on crustaceans. Till then, the methods of age determination were indirect. And the word indirect here means the age of an individual cannot be determined by any way. Group of animals can be, uh, uh, the age of a group of animals can be determined, and this is the indirect way. Methods used, growth studies in captivity, mark release experiment, in star as an indicator for age. In star here is, if I, as a crustacean biologist, know how many times does the animal molt every year, I will assume that if the animal molts three times a year, and if I know that the animal had molted nine times, I will assume that the animal is six years old. But the animal may skip one of the molts in reality. Some animals may molt more than three times, so it is not very accurate and may underestimate or even overestimate the age. Hmm? Those are the indirect methods to guesstimate, guess and estimate. We invented the word guesstimated, the age in order to uh, find out some indicator for age. More novel technique was used uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, maybe more. The lipofuscin concentration. 
Lipofuscin is the brain pigment that is found in the brain of a crustacean. The brain of crustacean is known to be found in the eye stalk of the animal. This small tube-like structure that carries the compound eye on top of it. The brain is found in the eye stalk. If you are able to measure the lipofuscin pigment in the eye stalk, this kind of curve can be obtained. The x-axis here is the age, the age. And the y-axis is the concentration of the pigment. It is assumed that, assumed that by age, the pigment concentration increases. Hopefully, I can obtain the straight line model and then apply it on other animals. But the disadvantage of this method is it's very expensive, very tedious, and needs to be, this model needs to be determined as a reference model in every single place I need to apply it on the same organism. So if I need to compare the growth curve on the same bank, go back to the surf clam example, the same ba uh, bank, I cannot use one reference model to apply it on the whole bank if I know that the growth rate may vary. So I need to repeat to prepare the reference model every time I need to determine the age. So again, this is indirect. It does not give me the age of one individual. So the new technique came. Direct determination of age in crustaceans. This was the title of the project that I was leading with great scientists in Canada, Remy Rochette, UNB, University of New Brunswick, uh, St. John, Bernard Saint-Marie in Quebec, and Stephen Campana, the well-known famous scientist working in aging. This work started in 2007 at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. I was uh, working with Steve, with Campana, and we were chatting together about how on earth we can determine the age of snow crab. And we were on a lunch table with a snow crab scientists, and I suggested, what about the ice stock? And we started playing the, with the ice stock. One ice stock took me about two days to prepare 50 thin sections and to look for some indicators in the sections. So again, Remy Rochette, Bernard Saint Marie, Stephen Campana, besides myself, were the team who started this project in 2007. And then we found in one animal some growth bands in the eye stalk of the snow crab, and we decided to pursue or to shoot in the dark. And the project focused on four species, snow crab, sculpture shrimp, northern shrimp, besides the American lobster, American lobster. This is the main species in the crustacean fisheries in eastern Canada. It provides, with, it provides the government with more than $2 billion per year. Ice stock. This is the image of an ice stock. The tube-like structure that carries the compound eye and is attached to the carapace of the animal. After some experiments that took some time, I found out that by cleaning the ice stock and making some longitudinal and cross sections in this structure, as you see in image C, the two walls can provide you with thin section and using the famous isomet, slow speed uh, saw, it can give us the thin sections. 
results, <coughs> bands. This is the eye stalk of the steel crab, sorting from the right, moving uh, to the left, executical, epicuticle, executical, and the endocuticle. Endocuticle provided me with the growth bands. No growth bands were found in other, the other two layers. And in this guy, I found eight bands. Till now, I have not validated the animal. Sculptured shrimp. This is a species that is considered as a very good candidate in the aquaculture industry. Again, moving from the left to the right, epicuticle, exocuticle, and the endocuticle. The bands are very clear, and now I haven't validated the, uh, the annual deposition of each band. But it's very interesting to notice here that the exocuticle is wider than, relatively wider in this species than in the snow crab. There are a couple of literature talking about the width of the executicle that depends mainly on the habitat of the animal, whether it is benthic or pelagic. Another slide or another guy, another individual from the sculptured shrimp uh, having three bands. Northern shrimp, Pendalis borealis, the highest catch in a, a shrimp or prawn, as we call it here in Australia. This is the most important species in Eastern Canada and in Western Europe. But the American lobster gave me a hard time. It's, it has the growth bands in the eye stalk, but it wasn't very friendly. I found the growth bands but I couldn't find them in all size ranges. I found them in fewer animals compared to the two shrimp species and the snow crab. The eye stock of the American lobster did not show the growth bands in all individuals. And that's why we have two options. Either we call it a day for the uh, 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 lobster or to look for another hard structure. And this was about eight months after the beginning of the project. And we found that the gastric mill, gastric mill is a, teeth, a tooth like structure found in the stomach of the animal. Only carnivorous decapods. There are three kinds of ossicles or teeth. The central one is called urocardiac a pair of zygocardiac, one on each side of the central, and at the base, the, the mesocardiac. After some experiments, the blue arrow indicates the cutting axis that I used to give me this section after flipping it on its side. And the mesocardiac, indicated by the black arrow, has a bend. We didn't know what to call it, so we couldn't find it in any anatomy atlas or something like that, so we called it the bend. Compared to the eye stalk, the eye stalk you need to cut through the length of the eye stalk and to hunt for a place to find out the growth bands. Here in the gastric mill, you find the Growth bands are located in the band. Any scientist working with aging, uh, uh, aging organisms need to approach two main errors, precision and accuracy. Precision simply means reproducibility or repeatability of the number of bands. Again, it, this means that if I count the bands in one outlet of a fish without knowing the number of the bands in this outlet, and I extract the other outlet of the same fish later, count the bands, I should, if my, if my process is correct, I should have the same number 
of bands in both otolith of the same fish. Or if I'm using the same otolith, I count it today and two months later without knowing my results. The first time I should have the same number that I got from the first time. This doesn't mean that my count is correct, but this is an error I need to approach and to prove that my counts can be repeated, providing me with the same number of bands every time I count, or if I count more than one structure in the same animal, this should give me the same count. The other error is accuracy. How close is my count to the absolute, the real, or the correct absolute age of this animal. The first kind of error over the accuracy, I compared the number of bands in the gastric milk to the eye stock of the American lobster in those individuals that can provide me with the number of bands in the eye stock, and it gave me almost the same number. <clears throat> right eye stalk versus the left eye stalk in one of the shrimp species, again, almost the same. So it was accurate. But does this indicate the absolute age of the organism? In the second, in the other uh, shrimp species, again, the number of bands in the two eye stalks of the same animal were almost the same. The bands till now may be age indicator, may be molt indicator, or may indicate the number of molts that the animal had passed through till the time I sacrificed or I processed the animal, or it may mean nothing. And that's why I started looking for a validation tool, and I couldn't find a known age animal for any of the species at that time. The other way to validate the absolute age is to corroborate. If I am sure of any other way, indirect way, to guesstimate the age, I can use it as a guide to re the results of my process. Those were lab investigations. Bernard was rearing some snow crabs in his lab, and he was not sure when. He, uh, he was sure, but it wasn't 100%, plus or minus two years in a 10 years old crab, or model analysis. Some tags experiments were used in uh, Maine, in the USA, and the scientists extrapolate and made a model to indicate the age of the American lobster. So the lab, uh, the, the model was used by integrating some inputs using tagging experiments, lab experiments, and the model was very convenient to us. Now, the other way to corroborate the age or the new technique was, what about molting? The American lobster is known to molt twice a year for the first three or four years in the life history. After that, it molts once. So by a simple mathematical uh, procedure, you can estimate that five years old animal could have molted eight times. We are talking about five years old animal could have molted eight times. So if a five years age animal give me four or five growth bands, it shouldn't be the molting frequency. Let me show you some graphs. American lobster. Those are, the line here is the one to one age or guesstimated age. The black dots, the number of bands. When I added the number of molts that each animal molted, you will find that 
the number of bands were way off the number of molds, but closer to the guesstimated age. Again, the, uh, the black circles indicate the number of bands. The, the line is the guesstimated age. The, em the circles, the empty circles, indicate the number of molts that the animal may have molted every year. You see that the number of bands here are closer to the guesstimated age. And the number of molts are way off the age or the guesstimated age and the number of bands. In other crustaceans, it was completely different. Why? In the shrimp, in the nor northern shrimp, it molds 10 times a year, uh, 10 times, 10 times a year. So in two years old animal, biologists are sure that the animal should have molted 20 times after two years. If the bands are molt indicator, we should have, or sh we should see about 20 bands. So, started working with this species. I had massive length frequency analysis, huge sample, about 35,000 animals. Each mold indicates one year, so we have maximum five years, and the band count is the straight line, left y-axis. Just look at the right y-axis, this is the instar multiplied by five. So the first year, the animal should have molted 20 times. Second year, about 22. After six years, 30 times. Where are the growth bands? Here they are. Let's put them together. We will see that the growth bands are closer to the length frequency analysis results and the number of molds are way off. We are talking about 30 times higher than the number of bands. Now we started to be sure that in the northern shrimp, the bands are age indicator and not molt indicator. But now, what about molting? The molds here, the molds, if the concept or if the theory of the biologist who claimed that the bands should have been lost after each molt, I started playing with the calcine. Calcine is a chemical that binds with, car with carbon and it should deposit a mark. If the crustacean deposits or binds with the calcine, and if the band is not lost during the molt, the calcine mark should be retained after molt. So two questions, because this was the first time in the world to play with the calcine and crustacean <coughs> animals. Two questions, does calcine deposit a chemical mark in crustacean? The other question, if yes, will the mark be retained after a complete molting cycle. So the first experiment was apply calcine after three or four days, sacrifice the animal, check for the calcine mark in the structure and see whether the, the mark is deposited or not. The yellow image is the bright field image for the uh, uh, gastric mill. And the lower one, you can see easily here, the calcine mark at the edge, at the convex edge, which looks bright. Hmm? By playing with the wavelength in the uh, fluorescent microscope, you are sure that this bright field at the left edge of the gastric mill is the <coughs> calcine. Yes, the calcine can deposit, deposit a mark on the gastric mill, and the same was found on the eye stock. 
But again, this is the ice top. The lower image shows the bright mark at the right hand side edge. The other question, does this mark or is it retained after one, two, or three uh, molds? Yes. To the left, the image shows here the animal, the control, untreated. The bright mark is what is called autofluorescent. Autofluorescent is the mark that is found in all animals, even in those who are, that were not treated by calcium. By playing with the autofluorescent microscope, you can remove this autofluorescent mark and the treated animals on the right-hand side in the gastric milk that was sacrificed after two molds. The mark is very clear on the growing edge, which is the convex edge of the American lobster. Explanation? I don't know what is the mechanism. I don't know. But apparently, some mineralized component of the eye stalk and of the uh, gastric milk not lost during molting. But a surprise. The exuvia is the old skeleton that is lost during the, uh, during the uh, uh, molting. In the American lobster, I collected the exuvia few minutes after the molting ended, and the three ossicles were there. The mesocardiac was not found in the exuvia. This means that the mesocardiac, which is the ossicle that provided me with the growth rings, are not lost during molting. Is this only in the American lobster? No. In the crayfish, freshwater crayfish, the mesocardiac is not lost during molting. This means simply that at least the mesocardiac remains in the animal after all molting events. This means that the growth bands that I count are retained throughout the life of the animal. So I'm good. Application. Three case studies. I will share with you uh, the results of some case studies that I use the new technique on. I submitted those case studies for publications and I haven't heard back from the reviewers. Hopefully will go all right. So this was uh, Rochette Saint Marie. Uh, Neil Davis is one of my students who worked with me in this project and Stephen Campan. <coughs> Comparing the growth of American lobster in nine different latitudes. Here we are, the other side of the globe. It took me three days to come from this red square down here to Darwin. So, <laughs> so this is the eastern uh, coast of Canada. Nova Scotia is the little tiny peninsula in the center of the uh, uh, rectangle. Nine different latitudes. Those are indicated by uh, the, the marks here between north of Newfoundland in Labrador and down to Rhode Island. For the first time, sex-specific growth curves are obtained for the American lost. The red are females, blue are males. As you see here, females are always slower in growth than males. As you see in most of the nine sites, both sexes grow in the, uh, 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 similarly, the same rate, till they start to be off from each other, and this is uh, this can be explained. Till now, the age at sexual maturity has not been determined for this species. Hmm? So I am assuming I haven't done it yet that the age at sexual maturity is the point where the two lines start to diverge from each other. This is an example 
for uh, bail funding and from me. They are different in the point where both sexes started to be, to be off from each other. This was a breakthrough in studying the uh, American lobster growth. Again, for the first time, sex-specific uh, size at age relationship was determined for this animal. And this graph shows the mean, the mean age for stand, four standard sizes and their change with uh, mean temperature. It shows that at small sizes, the growth uh, or the age at size is similar, the, fir the, the, the top left panel, but the difference is shown in the larger animals. And I am assuming that as the size increases, the growth increases and the growth rate differs after the sex, sexual maturity is reached in males and females, and that's why the decrease in the uh, age at size is very clear at different temperature. This is for males and this is for females. The other case study, juvenile size at age on different substrates. And this was an honor student working with me, Terry Mensch and Remy Rochette. So again, we started to apply the new technique on juveniles. Till now, we didn't know the age at size or size at age for young juveniles. I'm talking about one to three years. And till this uh, uh, paper was submitted, we assumed that the animal grows on cobbles only and it does not approach the mud because it prefers cobbles right after metam uh, metamorphosis. Those are the images for juveniles, American lobsters, two, three, and four years old. And it was a surprise for us to see that size at age on mud may be higher than size at age on cobbles. Why? The only explanation that we can think of is the animals prefer to go, go to cobbles at certain time, it gets saturated. And at that time, the animals start to look for another substrate. And for the first time, we find out that some juveniles may grow faster when they grow on mud. The third and last case study is the size at age of Chilean species. After publications in 20, uh, after the publication was out in 2012, the scientists from different places in the world started to approach me to apply the technique. And uh, this scientist, Acuna, Enzo Acuna from Chile, we started collaborating together two squat lobsters and one nylon shrimp. And till that moment, they rely on length-based uh, model in their stock assessment, and they were not sure. One of the squat lobster lives up to 12 years, and by some way, they, uh, they were trying to convince themselves that length frequency analysis can be successful in 12 years a old animal, which, which has been proven wrong. Those are the sections of the gastric mill in the red squat lobster, <coughs> two, three, four, and five years old, yellow, and the eye stalk of the nylon shrimp. What kind of results? Again, the sex-specific growth curves were done for uh, those species and age at sexual maturity for the three species, red and yellow squat lobsters, nylon shrimp. So, pilot studies, I'm about to finish. Two pilot studies are going on right now. Three crab species in Alaska and one 
shrimp species, I am processing them and to see, to investigate whether the technique is applicable or not. Excuse me, so far it's going fine. They are, they show the growth bands and in Norway as well. But the next step will be, we need to validate the growth bands using an experiment in enclosures in the ocean after applying the calcine and to follow the number of bands that should be deposited after the calcine mark after one, two, or three years. And I am still working on them. This is my last slide to show you that sun can shine in Canada. Thank you very much.